Good evening and welcome to this week's episode of Coach's Corner. My name is Dwayne Dwyer. I go by the Mindset Coach and I'm joined by my good friend. The Uncle Junior and I go by the Consistency Coach. And together we are the coaches that represent Coach's Corner. Listen, we are excited about this week's episode as always. It just seems like we're always excited about these episodes, man. Because we believe that these are something that you can take right now and put them into action. And you can actually implement them into your personal life, your organization, and your relationships. And actually see transformation happening in real time. Now, caveat. If you came here and you're looking to be complacent, you just want to watch TV, you get finished with us, you're going to go and start clicking it. This is not the place for you. I'm just going to be honest with you. But if you're looking for growth, if you're looking for change and you're looking to be a new you in 2025, you're in the right place. Um, before, before we dive into this, like, Unk, man, listen, it is always good to share the stage with you, my brother. How has everything been going? Man, everything's been going good, man. You know, another day, another dollar and 25 with inflation. You know, we got a little pay raise. You know, so, um, but yeah, man, all is well, man, all is well. I'm looking forward to, um, which is our sixth episode right now. So, um, yeah, man, it's been a, been a great run so far. You know, I love I mean? it. So, I've been enjoying it. Looking yeah, forward to tonight. Absolutely. Did we get a pay raise? I didn't know that. Hey, listen, just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Very well. We appreciate it all. So we're going to go ahead and get this party started because at the end of the day, I mean, I just like what we're doing here on Coach's Corner. So I want to kind of just start off with a little brief introduction, if you don't mind. And yeah, we're going man. to dive right into it. Are you looking to transform your team into a high-performing powerhouse? Many organizations face the challenge of under-communication, stagnant, stagnant growth, and unacknowledged employee efforts. These issues can lead to decreased morale, reduced productivity, and stifled innovation. In today's conversation, we'll tackle these challenges head on, offering key strategies to enhance your team's dynamics and effectiveness. From establishing a clear vision and values to recognizing and rewarding contributions, we'll provide practical insights applicable in both corporate and small business sectors. Stay tuned until the end for a special treat that will help you to put these ideas into action and truly transform your team. So with that being said, brother, let's kind of get this party started so we can get into it. And the first topic of discussion, what I would like to go into is establishing clear vision and values. Now, I know you and I, we talked about vision and values in the past and uh, you've encountered them within your space. We remember them from our old military days, and mm-hmm. you know we established them when it came down to creating corporate, um, create, creating a coach's corner. But in your opinion, before we kind of dive into it, like if I can ask you off the cuff, like how influential has vision and values been to kind of like providing clarity for what you want to do moving forward? Ooh, man, good question. Um, I would say that the vision is, it's almost like the, the map, right? Almost like the road map, right? So the vision is the big picture, right? So if you was to open up an atlas or a map, you're going to see, um, hotels, you're going to see roads, you're going to see street time, you're going to see a whole bunch of different things, Right. That's the vision, right? But as you dial in and become more clear and direct with your vision, now you can start figuring out the path to get to the ultimate goal or to whatever it is the vision is is predicting or whatever it is the goal is. You know what I'm saying? So um, that, that's kind of where I want to start with that right there. So I think that's the, 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 the representation of the, the clear picture or the map of what is to come or whatever it is you're seeking out. You know, I really love your analogy of the map in this perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think you're 100% spot on. Like it really helps us to see just the entirety of what we're going to be working on. It is the map. Look, we're here and we want to get here. And Mm -hmm. everything we're going to do moving forward has to fall within the scope of this map. We're not going to bring in a different map sheet. We're not going to go a different direction. We're not going to do any of those things. We're going to do everything moving forward based upon what this map is showing us. What I want to add to what you're saying here is the values. It's actually how we're going to behave. 
like the do's and don'ts in the midst of our interactions as we move forward. This is how we represent the company. This is how we better ourselves in conjunction with that. And oh yeah, by the way, because of the way that the organization is set up, set up, we're going to give you training along the way to kind of help improve with the character that we display so that we can be better for the team to ensure that we get there in an expedited manner. So I love the analogy of the map. And I just wanted to add that piece to it, man, because I think mm-hmm. it's pretty good as we get into it. So yeah. as you guys have started listening, right, I think you kind of see where we're going in this conversation. So wherever you are, go ahead and hit the like button, hit the, you know, hit the uh, thumbs up, whatever that looks like, and subscribe. Because at the end of the day, this is what we do on a weekly basis. Now, the first question under establishing clear vision and value is what are some practical steps that teams can take? to integrate core values into their everyday work processes and decision-making. All right. Even before we get here, I kind of want to, because as I was thinking about team, team looks different to a lot of people, right? So we have football teams, which make up of, you know, 50 some players There's 11 people on each side of the field at a time. Each player on the field on the team has their role. You know what I mean? And at the same time, on a different scale, we can look at a relationship between a husband and a wife, a man or a woman. Um, There are a team. Coach's Corner is two people. It's two men. We are a team. So I do want to start off by saying um, that teams come in different shapes and sizes and they... um, it's, 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 it's different. There can be a different amount of people in the team, right? So a team doesn't necessarily just have to be 11 people or two people. It can be different amounts of people. You know what I mean? So I kind of wanted to start off with that um, and kind of set a little guideline or a little baseline for what a team is. Um, um, what are your thoughts on, on like the, the team of actually kind of what a team is? Um, in your opinion, a little bit before we kind of dig into this question a little bit. No, I, I like it. Um, I think in the scope of what we knew team to be years ago, um, mm-hmm. a bunch of people that come to one disclosed location and we all do work that is inter- interlocked with one another. And then now you look into what we're doing right now. A team can be people in different locations still doing work that is interlaced with one another but they're in totally different locations and they may not only talk to each other like once a week, but then you have the team, like you just said, you know, we have a football team, a basketball team, a baseball team, a hockey team, whatever that looks like. And we come together for practices, team meetings and so forth and so on. But I think within the scope of all of those different types of teams to include husband and wives, to include two brothers on coach's corner, I think we have to look at what we call, you know, team development. And so we got to go through the form and storm and norm and performance stages of team development. And some of the team, some members of the team, they glide through it because of their ability to kind of interconnect with people and to accept people where they are and not try to enforce dominance and things of that nature. So when you ask that question, that's the first thing to come to mind. All of these different types of teams, I think leaders got to be flexible and ambidextrous when it comes down to managing these different teams. Um, you know, looking at kind of like a, what was it? The Tom Brady roast the other night. I love mm-hmm. how they, they, when Bill Belichick took the stage, how the respect that they had for him and just considering like, this is an NFL football coach who dealt with several different levels of talents and how they all loved him. And so when we look at that, we have to come to the conclusion that he had to be a master at team development. Mm, yeah. Okay, I like that. All right, so now, now that we got the team um, kind of set the baseline for the team, I'll go back and answer the question. So um, to repeat the question, what are some practical steps teams can take to integrate core values into their everyday work processes and decision making? I'm going to start off with um, communicating, communication, right? So I think one of those practical steps is that we are using similar language to communicate so that everybody can understand. You know, if we're on a football team, if we're playing offense, these are certain verbiage and certain language that we use so everybody can understand exactly what we're going through. 
just like when we was in the military, we had the phonetic alphabet. You know what I mean? So you don't get the B's, the C's, the D's, the E's mixed up. It right. was Bravo. It was Delta. You know, it was Echo. It was specifically um, designed to be different. So there wasn't that confusion because one of the biggest problems that we have on teams is um, communication. You know what I mean? When communication is not there, your your team can 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 be destroyed. You know what I mean? And it's very hard to have a high performing team when there is a lot of miscommunication or um, communication that's not effective. So um, just to start off, one of the practical steps that teams can um, take to integrate core values is using um, certain terms and certain communication that everybody is kind of sort of familiar with. So using like, 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 like language. I like that. I, I really like that. So I'm going to use, I'm going to, I'm going to take like language and I'm going to raise you performance evaluation. Okay. Mm. Because one of the things that I really do, I really do believe that at the end of the day, when it comes down to what you do, right. Whether it's, you know, ones and zeros, whether it is, you know, you know, keyboard entry, whether it is jackhammering the sidewalk, whatever that looks like. I believe that those are tasks that are just that are adjusted. We make micro adjustments incrementally throughout the space of time. So that's done in real time. If there's something that you need help with, that's what the interaction is all about. So we help employees improve performance day by day, but we help employees improve behavior throughout the course of evaluations and periodic assessments. So when it comes down to it, when, you know, say you say you want to do something, we so we, so we establish performance measures in the beginning. And once you establish the performance measures, you say, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this. And out of these things that you list, one of them is personal to you. The other three is how you're going to be a great asset to the team. So when we do our periodic review, now we're looking at, have you done this? How far, how far are you along with this one? How far are you along with this one? How far are you along with this one? How can I help you with this one? Because this one is yours. And as a leader, I want to make sure that you have not only began it, but how can I help you be successful at it? So I think with performance evaluations, not only can we help you be a success on the team, right? but we can help you be a part of the team to where you feel valued and you're adding value to the team. And we can look at this thing that you're doing to where you are bettering yourself. And I can help you achieve that through just, just, just making sure that it's written down, it's codified and we all understand it. Okay. So adding value, all these different things. So you said, performance evaluation, right? So we're talking about teams. And as I just spoke a few minutes ago, teams come in different shapes, sizes, and forms. Mm -hmm. As in forms. Now, what you said sounds good if I'm in corporate America. Sure. If I am on the job and I'm a manager and I got some people under me. But how does performance evaluation work in a relationship between two people? So now you got the husband and the wife. Who are you? Who's 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 evaluating people's performance, you know, and the reason why I say that is because I know that everybody in our audience is not necessarily in a leadership position. Everybody is not owning their own company. For some people, um, their team is them and their husband or them and their wife or, you know, maybe a couple of people that they work with or maybe a business partners with. So I just want to kind of speak or talk about the part of the relationship piece or the people that their team is just maybe them and their spouse, yeah. you know? So how does performance evaluation work when it comes to a husband and a wife or, and I know this different per couple, but mm -hmm. how does performance evaluation work when you have a team of two people? It's not written down. Mm. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> listen, I don't mean, I don't mean, I, I want to make sure I'm clear. Like when a husband and wife come together, they are a team. Mm -hmm. The beauty of the team is that we're working towards one common vision. Mm -hmm. So how do I know that I'm actually a value to the team if I'm not listening to the feedback? Right. So couples give each other feedback. Let me say it again. They give each other feedback, not criticism. 
Criticism is something totally different. We give each other feedback based upon the value that we're adding to the team. And it's not always negative. It's probably more positive feedback than it is negative. But there has to be constant, going back to your original point, it has to be constant communication within the team so that I can understand whether or not I'm fulfilling my role in my team, right? I don't want to change it from the relationship, but I'm going to go to a basketball team. Think about going down the basketball court. They're constantly communicating to one another. Like they're setting screens, they're doing picks, they're getting open, they're getting to the spot that they're practice, ready for the ball to be you know, sent at the right time so I can make the jump shot. But if you miss my window, now there's a phase two that we got to go into because we rehearsed that. So now when we take a time out, now we're going to talk about it. How did you miss your window? So forth and so on. I'm not criticizing you. I want to understand what you've seen. So if I need to adjust what I'm doing, now I know what I can do. Well, I think the same thing happens in relationship. You see what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. if we drop the ball, if we, and I'm, I'm being honest, if we drop the ball on something, we need to understand where we drop the ball at. This isn't criticism. This is assessing assessing the behavior that we displayed in real time so that we can know the things that we need to change moving forward. Maybe it was all me. Maybe I said, you know what? I, I just, I, I forgot. I told it. I bombed on it. I, I slept on it. I forgot. You know what I'm saying? And that's okay. But the only way I can, you know, I can own it and be forthcoming in it if it's something like that, or it can be something totally different to where I was totally unaware what you needed in that moment in time so I can give you the proper assist so that you can be great in that moment. So I, I really think it's the same. It just is delivered different. It's not as structured. It's not as formal, but it is definitely coming via a conversation. Yeah. I like that, man, because like I said, I just think that, <coughs> excuse me, different people that, that may be listening and, you know, their relationship is different, but I can definitely see, you know, because, you know, I'm married and, you know, there is some evaluation. There are some things that, that my wife may say to me that, that she may want me to change or adjust. You know what I mean? And the same thing goes with her. Um, or that we may bring up certain things that we may not notice about ourselves or something like that or something that we think may be beneficial um, as we work on ourselves or something like that for the relationship in general. You know what I mean? And But there has to be a little bit of time that goes past, you know what I mean? To And, you know, even with myself, people have to have, you know, time to change or time to adjust and time to evolve. You know, when you've been doing something for so long, for so many years, and then someone brings something to your attention that can make you better, where you haven't been habitually doing that, you've been doing right. something different. So it's going to take some, you know, some time to adjust. And so, you know, even just giving grace while people are adjusting or, or going through that um, evolution where they're getting better is um, is also something that I think that's important. But. Absolutely. And I think that's part I think that's part of the team dynamics. The beautiful part of the team dynamics is that we start to understand each other. I understand the things that I need to do to put you in a position of greatness. I understand when you're not feeling your best, you're not performing your best. And I know I need to pick up and do more. Like, I think that's all in the team dynamics where we're learning each other. And in the midst of learning each other, again, whether we're talking football team, basketball team, hockey team, relationship, it doesn't really matter. I think it's the same. It takes for each person to learn the people or the person on the team. The more we learn, the more we dis the more we can see where we can help out. And I think that's I think that's a great place um, to start as we as we're diving into this. Yeah, man. Speaking of which, I think it's a good place to get into the communication piece of it. Because mm -hmm. you started it, you said cultivating open communication in so many words. So mm -hmm. I kind of want to get after the strategies. So what strategies can leaders employ to ensure that communication remains open? and effective even during times of stress or conflict within the team. Ooh, this, this, this is a tricky one. Um, we have different types of, of leaders. Some leaders are very um, communicative. You know, they will send out emails. They will send out smoke signals. They will call, blah, blah, email, everything. They will send out all of this stuff. And um, some people are not as um 
that's that's not necessarily their style. They don't necessarily feel that it's that important to communicate back and forth, necessary to close the loop, you know? So I think one is to, first of all, lay down and put in what the boundaries of communication are, right? So in the military, you know, sometimes, you know, when, when we came in the military, there wasn't cell phones. When we retired from the military, there was cell phones, right? So the communication between the time we got in and the time we left was 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 different, you know? So um, we went from, you know, having a roster to one person called this person to this call this person, this call person to get a group, you know, to get the message out to everybody else. You know what I mean? Nowadays, they can send a group message and everybody can get the message at the same time. So I think one of the things we can do is put in the boundaries. This is how we're going to communicate. We're going to use, we're going to communicate via email. We're going to communicate through a personal phone, through a business phone. How are we going to communicate? Because I think we run into a lot of problems with just how we're going to communicate and it gets tricky. I remember one year I was working, we had, you know, walkie talkies, we had email, we had personal phone, and then we had an app that people were using, but some people didn't want to use their personal phone. Some people couldn't figure out how to work the app. And that just caused a bunch of confusion in itself because you had different people trying to communicate on different platforms. Everybody didn't have a walkie. So we can't, we can call these three people on a walkie, but we got to call these two people on the cell phone and we got to call these eight people on the app, you know? So I think, like I said, just to, just to begin with this, the communication piece is one is that in your type of team, you guys need to discuss and figure out how we are going to communicate and what is the best way for us to communicate effectively. Man, I, I love that. I, um, me personally, I do not like, I'm just going to say it that way. It's not that, mm -hmm. it's not that I believe that everybody should stop doing it. I just don't like the management by text message yeah. um, mode of communication, because I think at some point there has to be vocal, right? A vocal compliance mm -hmm. that takes place. If I call Mr. Martin and say, hey, Mr. Martin, I need for you to come in a little early this morning because you and I are going to go on a special task, right? I need him to verbally comply that, yep, I got it. I'll be there at this particular point in time, blah, 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 blah. But if I send you a text message, then I'm hoping you got it. You may not necessarily reply. Like, sure, mm -hmm. I can pick up the phone and call you at that point, but why didn't I just do it to start with? So yeah. for me, I will start off by saying, when, it's, when, when we ask the question, what strategies can leaders employ to ensure communication remains open? I will start off by saying that leaders do it first. Leaders model what open communication look like. So that means at some point a leader may have to be transparent to the group. You know, when leaders become transparent, then what ends up happening is that it start to foster an environment of trust. So I give you and then eventually you get to the point you start to feel comfortable. You start to know me better as a person and then you start to want to open up. I will also say that leaders must become inquisitive about the people that are on their team. If you don't become inquisitive about who they are, who their family members are and what their goals and aspirations are, then eventually I'm going to start to feel like you don't really care about me as a person. And so leaders, not only do they have to model open communication, they have to become inquisitive about, about the people on their team so that they can learn each member of the team. And then at some point, you're going to have to verify that you have the mental recall to say, hey, how is Darshan doing? You know what I'm saying? Like you got to start calling people by name. Right, the shell. I'm sorry, I said it wrong. The shell. How's the shell doing? Don't, <laughs> yeah. don't, don't shoot me, Miss Uncle Junior. I apologize. <laughs> How's the shell doing? You, you see what I'm saying? Like, I need to call the person that is significant to you. Like, how are they doing? Because then you're going to be like, whoa, like, you remember that? Yeah, I remember that. I remember all of you. Something about all of you. If you got kids, what are their names? You know what I'm saying? What are their ages? Like, what do they like doing? What school do they go to? Those things. So now you're, you not, you are embodying an environment to where open communication permeates. When we're at meetings, like I understand that we got work to do, but if we have blocked off a portion of time for the meeting, 
if the meeting is supposed to last 30 minutes, let's get the meeting over with in 15 or, or 20 minutes so that I got like five minutes of connection time. You see what I'm saying? Oh, I'm sorry. Five minutes of connection time in the beginning, do the meeting, and then let, let me pull certain people aside so I can have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them. I think those things are important. Now, here's the catch. When stress happens, when turmoil happens within the environment, sometimes leader, leaders need to allow it to happen because this is the thing that I really and truly do believe. I believe conflict has a have has a beautiful opportunity for whoever is in conflict to become closer and bond together. That's kind of like the second stage of the team development stage, right? Storming. When storming happens, if a leader allows, but monitors, that's the other part. We got to monitor it. You can't just let it happen. And then they get to the point of fisticuffs, right? We're not doing that. We're going to allow them to work out their own differences. If they can't work out them on their own differences, then we sit both of them down and we point them back to the vision and why we're part of a team. Because in some place, whatever it looks like, the conflict only exists is because one person wants to be dominant over the other or the other person believes that their voice is more important than the other or whatever that looks like. So we got to make sure that at the end of the day, if there is conflict, a lot of conflict to happen. As long as it doesn't get outrageous, let them work out their own differences. And then once they work out their own differences, watch how they bond together afterwards. I like that. And I also think that it's okay to input um, certain levels of stress into the training. Um, you know what I mean? Not to the level of detriment, but I think it's good. <laughs> Excuse me. Both of us have trained future officers in, you know, in our career, you know, with, with what you've done with training um, officers and stuff and me teaching um, ROTC and stuff like this. I remember that um, during the phase of their training, they have to um, learn how to um, read op orders, um, understand the op orders, and then disseminate the op order down to their team, right? And then they would go out and do these stick slings and these trainings and stuff like that. And we would incorporate a certain level of stress onto the cadets to see how they performed. Because as one of the things that we learned in the military is that you train as you, 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 you fight, you fight like you train, you know what I mean? So if you train in crappy, you're going to fight crappy. If you, if you train hard, then you're going to fight hard. So we always inputted a little stress in the training and even sometimes the lessons and stuff that we taught so that when, when stuff hit the fan, they were a lot more resilient to being um, in the stressful environment. They've been in a stressful environment where they've had to communicate, you know what I mean? And as an air traffic controller, we, we, we taught these things, you know, even in open, you know, if, you know, if, you know, you're talking to an aircraft and you lose communication. So like I said, we train. Um, so like I said, having training built into or having stresses built into the training, um, low levels of stress, I think can eventually help um, down the road with when things actually do get stressful. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and going back to your previous point, because we view corporate America and small business as teams going back to the family dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. When conflict arises between spouses, you have a golden opportunity before you if you can learn how to do so with a level of maturity to recognize that we're not the enemy. The conflict is the enemy. Yeah. Our goal is to come to a level of conflict. I mean, come to a level of understanding so that we can conquer the conflict. That's the key. And I think a lot of times what you'll find is that two, you know, two people who are in relationship, they will have an adversarial approach because, you know, my thoughts are this and your thoughts are that and you're not accept. That's not that's not how it should be. Yeah. You have to recognize that we are the team. We're always the team. And if you don't view it as we're always the team, then the conflict is going to win. Right. But if you are always the team, if we're valuing each other always, even in the midst of stressful situations, then we realize that we're not the enemy. We're trying to come together so that we can gain an understanding on how to conquer this conflict collectively. Now, I do like what you said about adding rigor to the training environment, because if we as a couple, 
if we're following along our growth pattern, if we're pursuing our dreams and aspirations, that by itself is going to add rigor to our life as we continue to go from, you know, from goal to goal to goal, achieving milestone and achieving milestone. So mm -hmm. that's going to add a degree of rigor. Why? Because we're encountering certain things that we've never encountered before. And it's going to change us into the person that can receive what's on the other side of accomplishing that goal. So it has to do it. And what I need for, you know, what I need for my partner to do in the midst of this, I need for you to look out, look out for me. Yeah. When am I at the point to where I am acting out emotionally, not against you, just I'm not acting like myself. At some point, you may need to pull me aside and say, hey, you good? You know, do we need to have this conversation? Like, what's going on? How can I help? And that works both ways. That's why I say relationship is the ultimate training ground. Like, it is literally a thing that exists within your close proximity to where you have two people who can help each other grow. You own okay. it, man. It was a good yeah. one. <laughs> hey, I love it, man. I love Clean it. it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. Let's kind of yeah, um, let's kind of dive into the next section, which is investing. Yeah, investing in personal and professional growth. Now, you, of course, you know these are these. This right here is where we hang our hat. Yeah. So the first question here is, how can mentoring within the team enhance both personal and professional growth? for mentors and mentees alike. Ooh. This is when this is when you get to learn from each other. You know what I mean? Like if um it's kind of hard not to keep going back to the military. You know what I mean? Cuz you know, I spent 20 years there, so that's where a lot of my mentoring and and mentoring, you know, both sides of the coin, that's where I spent a lot of a bulk of my life, you know, being in one of these two roles and sometimes in both roles at the same time, you know what I mean? Um, but with different people, like I may be a mentor to somebody, but I'm being more to well, actually this it's like that now. I'm a mentor to somebody, but I also get mentored as well. You know, so um, I think one good thing about the mentor and, and the mentee, I think one good thing is that especially when you're the mentee, right? So as, as, as a young private, as a young soldier, or as a young male or young person or something like that, you get to get input or you get to be fed information from someone who has kind of sort of already, already experienced life. You know, if you look at the team leader, they've already been through this, they've been through that, they've been through a whole bunch of different, these different things. So you can benefit because you can learn how, not to do certain things or how to do things um so as you don't have as many problems you know a lot of times we, we tell our kids hey look you know i already been through it so you don't have to be so you don't have to go through it so i say you know as a mentee you go through that and then as the mentor sometimes you got youth you got someone young and you got them coming from a different perspective you know when i was a leader i always you know not always. Um, a lot of times I listen to Joe. I listen to, to the soldiers because one thing about the soldier is they're going to figure out um, you say, hey, look, we, we need to we need to mop this whole floor and we need to buff it and we need to get it done by the end of the week. Joe or, or ain't nobody leaving on Friday. Joe going to figure out how we're going to do it. You know what I mean? And make sure it's done right so they can have their weekend, you know, and they may have an idea that excuse me, that I may not have ever thought about. So um, I think when you are mentoring your team and stuff like that, I think, you know, being an example is, is very helpful, but I just think that um, how can mentoring within the team enhance both personal professional growth? Like I said, I think it gives both people the opportunity, both parties, the opportunity to learn from each other and to grow and be better as a person and be better as a team. But, kind of goes back to the open communication. You know, if there's not that open communication there, then you can't get to the mentor phase. You know what I mean? Because if you're trying to mentor somebody and your communication is jacked up or they're not able to learn or to receive from you because there's a personal issue or because something is there, because the relationship is not there, then you're not going to be able to mentor that person. So again, this still goes back to you have to have the communication piece before you can get to the mentor phase. Man, I love how you brought that full circle just now. That was a, that was good. That was really good. Um, I'm going to look at it from a, I, I got to go a different approach. 
Yeah. Only because you stole all the thunder that was to be stolen. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think from the perspective of a mentor, a mentor first can learn a lot about themselves as they're starting to look across their team. First and foremost, you have to be an objective observer of what is actually happening. Who are my top performers? What we want to do is we want to, we, a lot of times we want to kind of cater to the masses, which is kind of like the wrong thing to do. Like who is my top performer right now? And it's not just about a performance thing. It is also about a personality thing. Like which person is the one that is for the team? Who is displaying like the team spirit within their own individual activities and things of that nature? Who is the one that's rallying the team when it comes down to, you know, meeting those those stress points that we have to do, meeting timelines and so forth and so on. So these are the people that I want to pull aside and I want to do some one on one with. I want to deal with my high performer. Why? Because I know for a fact that that person is a leader based upon performance. But I also want to pull aside the individual that is a rallier, the person who rallies the team and bring them together because this person is a leader based upon their ability to bring people together and give them pep talks and energize them to do certain things. This person is a leader in my absence. This person is a leader by performance. So what do I do is I pull these people in and sit down and talk to them. And I ask them like, so what's going on? How are you doing what you're doing? Like, how can I help you be better at what you're doing? But I still got like eight other people out there, but mm -hmm. I'm spending more time with these two people. So one of the most valuable lessons that I can learn as a leader is that I spend 80% of my time with 20% of my population. I want to spend a larger portion of my time with my high performers because my high performers are going to be the one that actually be my subordinate leaders for the team. Now, the other 20% of my time that I spend with the entire team, I am still talking with them. I'm still pouring into them and things of that nature. nature. But here's the other side to it. I get to learn a lot about myself based upon the way that I interact with not just my high performers, but the team as a whole. Because in the midst of, and I'm gonna steal your thunder for a second, in the midst of communication, in the midst of learning how they do certain things, in the midst of learning how to interact with people, I can actually identify insufficiencies within myself. Maybe the way that this person deal with people is a whole lot better than what I deal with them. And maybe I can learn from that person. Maybe the way that this person does this particular task is not only faster, but more efficient than the way that I do it. So I can learn from them as well. So now what I do as a mentor, I do not reject my humanity. I say, you know what? That's awesome. I could, I don't know how you did that. Could, would you mind teaching me that? So I do not act like I tower above them. I make sure that they understand that I'm a part of the team. I make sure that they understand that like Al Jarreau said, we're in this thing together. Right. And so I think in the midst of that, that, um, that symbiotic relationship, that, that give and take, that push and pull that we have, that me talking to them as a leader, but I'm not towering over them as a leader. They're more open and honest with me. Then what I find is that they give me feedback when I'm not even around the team. And then they give me valuable feedback on some of the things that they discovered, some of the information that came from the team that can actually make what they do better. I think that's one of the biggest things right there. A lot of leaders believe that, hey, I'm the leader. Do as I say. No, no, that's that's like that's that, that's that's going to be part of the job description. Don't have that behavior. Right. Don't be the leader. Do as I say. Be the leader. I'm a part of the team. And when you do that, what you will find is that not only will they open their arms and receive you as a part of the team, but they'll willingly give you the respect as the leader. Yeah. So I got a question for you. Um, we hear it all the time. Right. And what I want to know your thoughts about this, you know, maybe from a corporate or a relationship, you know, or are you your team? Right. So you platoon Sergeant, um, Sergeant First Class Dwyer, you got three, you got four squad leaders and you each, each squad got eight or nine Joes in it. Right. You guys are performing well above the standard or you guys are performing well below the standard. You know what I mean? Some people believe that you are your team. You know what I mean? So what are your thoughts on, you know, are you your team? You know what I mean? Because they say you, you want me, you want me to tell you about coach. Look at the look, look, look at the circle he hang around. And that's and I'll tell you who he is. So what are your thoughts on that? Are you your team? So I, I love that question. And I learned a very valuable les lesson in relation to that years ago. 
leaders accept responsibility when things fall through. However, when things are going well, when you got high performance being met, so forth and so on, what they do is they give credit to the team. So I think when you look at it from that perspective, that is that that's really how I believe. And I think it's the right thing to do. If we're failing, that's on me. That's on me as the leader. If I'm a coach of a football team and the team lost, that's me. I got a team full of superstars behind me. How do I know we drafted all of them? They're all superstars. I got a team full of, you know, just awesome basketball players behind me. I got a team full of thoroughbreds, you know, you know, as jockeys that riding these horses back here. Mm -hmm. If they lose, that's my fault. Why? Because I didn't train them to the degree in which they were supposed to be trained in order for them to get the win. Now, when they win, that's on them because they took the rigors of the training that I gave them and they excelled when they had to perform. So I think we got to look at it from both perspectives. That's just that's just not like a one size fit all. Mm -hmm. The leader, again, that's why you're the leader. You don't push it and say, oh, well, the reason why we lost is because, you know, uh, Garfield over there, he didn't do his job. And he went, no, that's not what leaders do. Yeah, you I didn't play one game as a coach. Yeah. I didn't play one down. Exactly. That's not what leaders do. Mm -hmm. Leaders say, you know what? Don't look at them. Look at me. I own all of it. We lost. We didn't look good. I did not prepare them properly. But when they win, leaders push their chair back. Come on up to the mic. You, come on. Come on, all y'all. Because I want y'all to talk to them. These were the ones who actually did it. Only thing I did is train them. That's it. And I think that's the answer. But when you come to my NCOER. <laughs> because, hey, if, if, if Joe, if I had three Joes, it went to the soldier of the month, couple on one as E5. Yeah, I, I trained and, and and mentored, you know, P PFC Dwyer to win um, soldier of the quarter. You know what I mean? They go on my NCOER. So um, I get it. Um, yeah, I get it. I, I see. I definitely see. I definitely see your point. I definitely see it from um, a bunch of different perspectives. You know what I mean? So um, and I don't know exactly where I sit on the fence at. You know what I mean? I, I see it. I see it a bunch of different ways. I see in the sense that I am my team. And I also see a sense that, you know, I, I only can I only can play my part in the team, you know. But I think that regardless if there is a failure amongst the team, if I am in charge, I think that that does give me um something to look at and then back to what you said earlier to evaluate and see how we can progress and move better going forward. So I love it. One other piece I add to it. Um, we can, cause you know, some people I'm sure as they hear this, they're able to hold up, but what if this person is an underperformer? Then they should have been off the team before you got to the playoffs. I'm just, I'm, yeah. I hate to say it that way. Yeah. I'm just being honest. Like if they are underperforming, rehabilitate them, make sure that they're performing at the standard. If you've done all you can to rehabilitate them, then they need to be moved to a different team or, or, or do something. But at the end of the day, they're not actually performing the standard. And that's something that we have to, that's the hard part of it. That's the hard part of the job. Like yeah. the worst thing any leader has, the worst portion of leadership is actually going and giving somebody a pink slip and say, hey, you know what? Um, we no longer need your services. That is difficult. But here's the other side to it. The diff, Even the, as, as difficult as it is for you, look at who you're helping. You got to fill that slot. Don't get me wrong, because if you don't fill the slot at all, that means now they got to pick up the, the, the slack. Mm -hmm. But if you fill that slot with a person who can perform, it helps the team. So you got to kind of get your ego out the way and say, hey, I'm here to benefit the team. I work for the team as a leader. That's the answer. There is no other way. Yeah. And I, th I think that's important, too, because we're talking about keys to a high performing team. Sometimes you have to cut the fat. You know what I mean? Everybody is not necessarily valuable member of the team everybody is not necessarily supposed to be on the team you know what i mean we, we all seem to move at 300 they only had they, they had 300 you know what i mean everybody wasn't fit to be part of part of the 300 everybody is not going to cut the mustard on your track team or your football team and let's be honest when we go back to relationships too there are going to be some red flags or something like this and you may have to be like look this person ain't willing to play um, by the same rules on this team. So, you know, this team 
it's not going to be. You know what I mean? And I think that that's okay. And I think that's what we need to do. If we want to have an effective team and we want to have a, have a high-performing team, you can't have a bunch of low performers on a high-performing team. And sometimes we get in relationships with people who are low-performing and we're expecting to have high performance and it won't work. So you better go out there and figure out what, what some of these high performance teams look like. Well, that's what we out here doing right now. That's what we're doing we're right now. Give y'all the code right now. Just remember, yeah. every race car need a tune up. Okay. There you moving, go. On, <laughs> moving on to the next section here fostering inclusivity and diversity. This one is like, I, I really like this one. So the, the question here is how can leaders effectively address and overcome unconscious bias? to create a more inclusive team environment? Ooh. I will say, man, so we, we kind of had the cheat code, right? So I'm going to speak to the cheat code, then I'll speak to the non-cheat code. So the cheat code is in the military. In the military, you are forced to be around so many different people from so many different environments. You know, the first when I went in the military, that was the first time that I ever, had ever been around an Hispanic person. Had never even seen a Hispanic person until 1994. You know, I was 18 years old the first time I saw one. So one of the things about the military is that you are going to be around people from potentially all different 50 states all different cultures, background, Puerto Ricans, Filipinos, Mexicans, Blacks, Whites, Africans, you name them, you around them. And the thing about them is you have to work with these people. So you are forced to learn about each other. Right. So what I would say is that as a, but as a civilian, you're not always in those situations. So one of the things that we can do, and you talked about it earlier with that community, we talked about it with the communication piece, spending time with the people on the teams. If you have that extra five minutes before a meeting, spend that time bonding, building the relationships. We all know, everybody on here, for the most part, who's listening to this, if we know somebody versus somebody we don't know, if there's a job opportunity and we, we and somebody good at we're more likely to hire somebody or at least reach out to somebody and say, Hey, look, there's a job opportunity over here. You know what I mean? Because we know that person because we had that relationship with that person. So um, <clears throat> how can leaders effectively address and overcome unconscious biases to create a more inclusive team environment, spend time with your subordinates, spend time with the team, learn about the team and you will be surprised at the the differences and the and the commonalities that we all have for the most part we all want the same thing we want to we want to get up we, we, we want to have less crime we want to be able to go back and forth to work in peace and eventually want to have a little bit of money and go on a couple of vacations a year and, and 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 have some fun and spend time with our family we all pretty much want the same thing you know what i mean but we, for the most part, we just have different ways of going about trying to get it, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But like I said, I think spending time with people and building relationships with people on your team will help a lot of this unconscious biases and different things like that to help create a more inclusive team environment. I like that. I, I really do. I'm going to take a page out of your book and what you did in the beginning. Before we get to that part, because I think you're absolutely correct. Before we get to that part, I think it's something that the leader has to do within themselves. Mm -hmm. I think they must first accept the fact that they have unconscious biases. Mm. I don't care who you are. Everybody has an unconscious bias. So we need to become aware of what unconscious biases look like. And then we need to do a very serious self-assessment so that we can identify if we can. Right. Ask people do a 360 degree of the people that know you best and start trying to identify the unconscious biases that we possess. Once we do that, then I think that will help us to become more aware, right? Spend, going now, spending time with our team, so forth and so on, having that having that, that two-way communication to where your team is not afraid to talk with you and things of that nature. And don't be so quick to reject what they're telling you. Listen to what they're saying. I really do believe that even though there are some people 
who will try to cater the conversation to where it benefits them. There is still there is still some degree of truth in there. So listen, gather information, so forth and so on. And then when we start identifying these things, these little these little cancers, that's what I tend to call them, start identifying these little cancers in the team, you know, speak to it directly. Pull that person aside. Don't embarrass them. Pull them aside. Have a one on one. Right. And then talk with them. Now, I have a philosophy. I need to be able to see a thing at least twice before I talk about it. Mm -hmm. So once I identify it first, I make a mental note. Right. Garfield, you know, he is kind of biased to the, you know, biased when it comes down to dudes. I got it. It's not a problem. You know, he feels that men get the job done faster. OK. You know, maybe in his mind, there is some truth to that. I'm not here to validate or, or anything of that nature. I'm here to ensure that the team doesn't separate. That's the thing. We're not we don't want a seg we don't want a segregative team. I don't want men on one side and women on the other. Now I want an inclusive team that values everybody. So once I see another behavior that says, hey, you know, this, that, this, that, the third, I pull Mr. Martin aside. We go to a one-on-one, -on -one, and then I don't go into the conversation accusing him of anything. I'm <laughs> asking him questions. Like, how do you feel about this? Like if if I had to, if I had, you know, Tom here. And, you know, Diane over here and I'm looking for the best qualified candidate, who would you choose? And of course, Mr. Martin Smart said, well, it depends on the qualifications. OK, cool. Let's just say both of them are equally qualified. They graduated from the same college and they have the same experience. Now, who would we choose? You know, because now what we're doing is we're starting to validate some of my assumptions. See, mm. I don't want to go in there, even though I identify the thing. It could be my own perception that I'm projecting on that individual. And so I want to, you know, start asking certain questions. Once he said, well, we're going to choose Diane. OK, why did you choose Diane? Because I'm getting after the root cause. Like, how do we get down to it? And then eventually I get to the point. I say, you know what, Garfield? I really thought that you had a bias against men. I mean, a bias against women. I thought you were all pro male. And in your mind, you just want to build an all male team and all the women can go, you know, in the kitchen. I'm joking. Don't don't yeah. just use an example. I got to say that. So I come forth and I be completely honest. And then he can say, oh, man, no, absolutely not. I think, you know, you got um, Sheila over there. I think Sheila's an awesome person and she does great work, whatever the case may be. And we all interact, you know, so no, absolutely not. OK, so now he knows where I was coming from. He knows what I'm thinking. And I was completely transparent with him. And I wasn't accusatory. And he walks out of there and he doesn't feel like you know, I've got a microscope on him because I think he's a bad person. So I think as leaders, we have to first address the bias that's within us. If any leader tell you that they have no bias, trust me, that's not an accurate statement. If you are a leader who listens right now and you believe that you don't have a bias, trust me, the only thing you got to do is ask around. They will help you to understand. Right. And mm -hmm. I think that's the great starting point when it comes down to this question. Man, that, that, that was good. That That helped me. That, that made me think more about the relationship piece, especially in the beginning. And when, when people jump into relationships and stuff, and that's why I think I believe that people should be healed first, because if you're not healed from a previous relationship <clears throat> and now you're jumping into a relationship and you're bringing in these mm -hmm. other biases from your other relationship, right? So every time in your first relationship, every time, you know, your husband did, did this, you know what I mean? He, he did every time he did this, that would happen. Right. So now in your new relationship, every time your new man is doing this, you're expecting for that to happen. So you close down or you end a relationship or something like that. You know what I mean? So, and I know I'm just kind of, you know, not necessarily in the relationship, but I think that a lot of people are missing out in relationships currently because they still have some biases from the path. Now, this is not to say that you haven't learned certain behaviors that call certain actions. That's different. You know, when someone is is drinking and then they decide to go upside your head, that's different. We're not talking about that. We're talking about something different, you know. Um, but sometimes we have been hurt in past relationships and we have seen certain behaviors in the past and we are expecting to see them in our new relationship because of certain biases and stuff that we have. And that's why, again, you know, it's important, you know what I mean, to go and get some help and support, especially if you want to have a high performing team, um, i.e. your relationship with your husband or with your 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 wife um, in the future. It's important to to get rid of some of those biases and not bring them into 
your current relationship or the future relationship that you want. Absolutely. And being that we just got finished talking biases, I think this is the perfect segue into the last question that we have moving forward. So this section is all about recognizing and rewarding contributions. So that said, the question here is how can organizations develop a scalable and fair reward system that aligns with their values and encourages desired behaviors? Man, I don't know from a big point, right? So I'm I'm a I'm gonna go with relationships, right? So I'm I'm gonna kind of speak on mine, right? Me and my wife, I think that we have a a very good relationship. Um, I think we are trending towards the high performing team um, area. Um, we've been together for almost we've been together for almost ten years, and where we at right now. Um, we still have some growing to do, but I also think that we have grown a lot, you know, so I'm just going to speak from the, again, from the relationship piece. Um, I don't reward my wife with gifts and she doesn't necessarily reward me with the gift that I like. Right. So, but what we do is, we do make sure that we value each other and that we are appreciative of the time that we do spend with each other. We are also aware that, you know, if we can do something for someone else, then we should be able to do it for our wife as well. Right. So in our relationship, you know, we have to make sure that we, um, in a sense, we kind of reward each other. Right. We, we, we go out, we work, you know, she does things around the house. I do things outside of the house. Um, but I need to show appreciation to her for the things that she done. And sometimes a reward is can sometimes be just simply showing appreciation, but letting her know that, hey, I appreciate what you did. You know what I mean? Putting giving her some extra money to put on her her Starbucks card every month, or you know what I mean? Maybe buying you know buying a tool or a device or something that she likes in the kitchen so she can do something that she does better you know what i'm saying so i just think just giving a little bit like that you know what i mean it's not necessarily a reward system but just being aware that when someone is working hard and someone is doing something for you or for the organization and this organization is our marriage in this in this sense that I reward her, you know what I mean, or acknowledge the fact that she's doing something for me for the relationship and vice versa. You know, and that's why for some people, it's they celebrate the anniversary, they go on a big vacation or something like that. Not necessarily a reward, but it's just to show the person appreciation and also to spend time and help build their relationship. So. Um, that's kind of where I want to, to, to roll with the relationship piece. So I'm really looking forward to what you have to say, you know, if you decide to take it to like, um, a corporate level or, or something like that, but. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go a different route. Not, not that, not because I don't agree with what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go a different route if there is leaders who are listening and trying to understand what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Um, because in the time and space that we exist in, I think it's easy to see that we have a lot of people who just believe that I should get a reward just for because I showed up. I did my job. Therefore, I need to be appreciated for doing my job. Now, that's what your paycheck is for. Your paycheck actually rewards you for getting your job. That's that's the agreement. You see what I'm saying? So I think every organization has to come up with what I tend to call a meritocracy. Right. It is a it is an environment that is based upon merit. You do these things. You receive this type of reward. And you remember when we had it in the army, like, and I'm just going to use a very simple uh, analogy. Like if you score 280 and above, and this is back when that was the scale, right? 280 yeah. and above on a 300 point scale, 280 and above on an APFT, you got a three day weekend. That's a meritocracy. So mm -hmm. it had no bearing on who the person was. It didn't matter what their creed, their race, their creed, their ethnic background, their religion, none of that stuff mattered. The only thing that mattered is what their performance said. And so a meritocracy rewards performance. So when an organization comes up with a meritocracy, then what you do is you eliminate all biases out of the system. So if you do this, this is the reward. 
You do this, this is the reward. You do this, this is the reward. And you will see it like pretty much everywhere. But what you have to do is you have to eliminate the opinion out of it because it is a metric scale system, not, my, not, a, not a subjective system. Whenever you have a subjective system, now it's based upon me and I get to decide who I want to give the award to a reward. to. I'm sorry. And when I get to decide now, I get the wield the power and that mm -hmm. becomes part of the problem. So as long as there's no subjectivity in your system, you're doing fine. But make sure that it's merit based. Yeah, I like that one. I think that was a good one. Well, hey, man. I think that brings us to the yeah, our actionable, actionable advice. Yeah, we wrap it up. I cannot remember who went first the last time, so I'm just gonna jump on out there. Okay, do um, it. For me, this is this is my thoughts. Um, for anybody who is listening, I think if you listen to everything that we talked about and you implement everything that you heard so far, I think you would incrementally become a better leader. Not that you're not a good leader now, but you can improve based upon where you are. I will start back in the beginning. We need to understand the stages of team development. Not only understand the stages of team development, but understand the leader responsibility in each stage. Why? Because it is the responsibility of the leader to help each person to help the entire team, I'm sorry, to help the entire team move as expeditiously through the stages of team development as you possibly can. Your job is to get them from onboarding to performing as fast as you possibly can. Why? Because the faster the team get to performing, the more productive they become. And those are my thoughts. Man, I like it. Um, here's my actionable advice for the week. Um, for the next seven days, if you are in a position and you are trying to create a high performing team, whether that is in your corporate America, whether that is the military, in your platoon, your squad, whether that is in your relationship with your spouse or your significant other. What I want you to do is every day for the next seven days, learn one thing about that person, right? So if you're in a relationship for the over with your with your partner then over the next seven days, you should have learned seven more new things. Now, this can be a lot more complicated or challenging if you have a platoon or you have 150 people working up under you. That's different. So if you are at that scale or that level of leadership, learn something about some soldier or an employee or a team member every single day and i mean not just hey you know what you know walk up to hey what, what's your wife's name right and then now you know the wife's name and that's it no generally try to learn something about them you know what i mean so that's my actual advice um for the next seven days man is just um learn something about somebody on your team for the next seven days and be intentional about it yeah, anything else before we close out, man? No, man, that was great. I just wanted to kind of tell you that. And uh, listen, man, for everybody who's heard this information today, this is this is great. Like this is stuff that if in, you know, in my twenties and thirties, if I had got this back then, man, I would have been a beast. You know what I'm saying? So I just yep. take it, take take heed to the advice. I think it would be valuable information. Yeah. Um, and with that being said, man, before we close out, man, you guys can follow us here every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Uncle Junior Network and on the Empower Perspective podcast. You can also tune in Friday nights, and I'll let you shout that. I'll let you plug that. Um, but you were doing so well. Up. I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Friday nights, every Friday nights, uh, the Hearts of Men podcast on the Empower Perspective YouTube channel at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. Again, come on out, enjoy, and have some fun. Yep. And with that being said, folks, we will see y'all next Tuesday. We are out. <laughs>